Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our first show of the Path 11 podcast with your hosts, Mike and April. We're very excited today to launch our first ever podcast, and our show includes interesting guests who are here to talk about subjects of consciousness, paranormal activity, lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences, mediumship, astrology, channeling, and all that good new age stuff. We would love to interview people and talk about subjects that you want to hear about, so if you have a show suggestion, please tweet us at our Twitter handle, at the Past Series. I, I just want to take a moment to explain what the point of the podcast is. I mean, you, you kind of brought that up in the intro, what we're going to cover. But when we got together back in, uh, when was that, 2008? I just mm -hmm. said, yeah, I just said it too. We, we wanted to focus on films. That's my background. I've done TV and films for almost 15, 20 years now. That, that's kind of our focus. And we, we like to tell stories through film. But it takes a long time to make a film. <laughs> and it's not something you can do every week. I mean, you can make a quick YouTube video with your iPhone or whatever, but it's just not the same with what we're doing with DVDs and online streaming and getting into iTunes. It takes six months just to get onto iTunes sometimes. Um, but yeah, with the podcast, we figured this is something we can do to get the information out quicker on a weekly basis. It's just audio. It's something you can put in your phone, your car, your streaming device of whatever kind. And you can use it as your, you know, for your commute to work, or if you're just working around the house and need something to listen to, this is just another alternative way of getting our information to you. Yeah. And when we think about it, you know, we've put out two films now, but our last film, The Path Beyond the Physical, we released in 2013. And here we are 2015, and we're still working on the last of the trilogy, the last film. But I think sometimes what people don't understand is, you know, they say, what? well, when's the next film coming out? And it's a process. It's something I think too, and, you know, I've always said this, that we're kind of working with higher consciousness. We're mm -hmm. working with guides, with, with spirit energy or source energy. So it almost feels like in the making of our films, there was quite a bit of time between each from the afterlife to beyond the physical that it almost feels like the film comes together when it needs to in the time that it needs to. And we promise we are working on the third film. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it does take time. And another thing too is the films to get them out once they're out. We, we actually all started this company a couple of years before Kickstarter was around and that's one way of getting funding for the films, but the other way is just to sell the films once they're done. And we did a you know a little pre-order, and that kind of helped too to get production moving. But the podcast is another way, another free thing that you don't have to pay for. You just click subscribe, maybe write a comment if you want how you like the show, rate it in iTunes. Um, but uh, it's just something free to give back to the the audience, and just something to uh, take with you to listen to whenever. You have time to listen to a podcast. So our first guest on our podcast is a person who we just love and adore, William Buhlman. Yes, William uh, has been a friend of ours since 2008 when we filmed him for our, our films. William has been studying out-of-body experiences since the early 70s, and he's since then written three books on the subject, Adventures Beyond the Body, which is his personal account into the afterlife. Uh, through out-of-body experiences. His second book, Seek The Secret of the Soul, is a collection of survey responses which he combined together into a book, a readable book that you can um, pick up in any major bookstore. And his third book, which just came out um, a couple years ago, right, right around the time that our film came out, uh, Beyond the Physical, Adventures in the Afterlife, which is a fictional tale based on William's true experiences in the astral realm, other dimensions, um, in the afterlife. So that's uh, his books. Uh, William also does a couple uh, workshops at the Monroe Institute. His first one is the OBE Intensive, which is usually about four times a year. Uh, you can find out the dates and information at William's website, astralinfo.org. And William also has a new workshop. Uh, it's called Destination Higher Self. And that is in August of 2015 and October of 2015. And I would check the Monroe Institute, their website, 
and William's website to get the prices and times and dates for those. And we'll be talking about more of that in a few moments with William. So I just love talking to William because he's so energetic. He brings so much life to the subject. You can feel his passion when he talks about out-of-body experiences and some of his personal experiences and just how he really feels like this information needs to be delivered to the mass population, that everybody should know this. And if they don't know it, that they should be learning it, exploring it. And, uh, you know, I think one of his missions is really just to make the world a better place and to elevate consciousness among all human beings. And we are so lucky to have him back again. Okay, William, welcome to the show. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here, Mike. We interviewed you on camera probably about six years ago now. And uh, we, we've met with you a few times at our screenings, and we met you at the Institute a few years ago. What can you tell us that's uh, happened since we last talked? Well, for the past five years, I've been the trainer for the Out-of-Body Exploration Intensive Workshop. Um, and that's been, I've uh, been very gratified with the results, and uh, that's just been a great program. And as you know, uh, Monroe Institute is the finest place that you could possibly do a workshop that explores consciousness because it's designed for that purpose. So it's it's just been a great uh, it's it's been a great working location for um, the workshops and the work that I do. And how did you uh, get started at the institute? Did you go to them, or they approach you? Uh, actually. Um, Skip Atwater contacted me uh, and asked me if I wanted to get um, involved in with the Institute. Uh, this goes back like six years ago. And it just, and he invited me down uh, to the, to the Monroe Institute to do a tour and to discuss, you know, the possibilities of what we could do together at the Institute. And since then, uh, it just started a great working relationship. I immediately started doing um, what then became the out-of-body exploration workshop. The first year, I did four of them. And it's just just been a great uh, collaboration in general. And it's just continued since then. Yeah, I, I noticed uh, when we went, I think we went in, uh, it was about spring 2013. And it was the beginning of a weekend or a week of your intensive workshop. And I, I remember Carol, who ran it at the Institute at the time, she was saying how it's a very intensive workshop. And we only were able to talk to you for maybe like an hour around our screening. It seems like a, a lot of work, but fun work for the participants. Is that still the case or is it? Is, is oh, it yeah, I, I keep it. I keep it extremely busy. Um, we do a lot of techniques. Um, I try to keep the lectures uh, to a minimum and as needed. Uh, and we do a lot of techniques. Um, and of course, everyone's in their own check unit, which is uh, makes it so different than many other workshop locations. I pack it full of experiential workshop material and techniques so that everyone is uh and also even during the night um generally during the night except for the first night from the second night on i wake people up in the middle of the night to do a technique uh because i found that that often that's when you're in the, a conducive state and all you're already relaxed you're you're in the ideal state to have not only an altered state or lucid dream experience, but also an out-of-body experience. So generally in my workshop, I'll wake people up between uh, anywhere between 2 and 3.30 in the middle of the night. And we actually will do some sort of technique then. So it's quite intensive. Yeah, and I also want to, you know, just back up just a little bit and really speak to your 40 years of really intensive experience with the out-of-body experience. I mean, you've written some great books about it, um, Adventures Beyond the Body, The Secret of the Soul, and your newest book, Adventures in the Afterlife. And this isn't just something that you've been studying for a couple of years and decided to go and teach this at the Monroe Institute, but I remember 
what you've shared with us in our films was the experiences that you were personally having and then feeling like in your own research there wasn't a manual to really teach people how to do this and you know just the amount of research that you've done and the studies and the collection of data that you got from people all over the world uh, has been pretty amazing in compiling all of the evidence and the techniques that you've created for your programs. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, actually, the this subject is my life's work. Um, uh, back in 1972, I, I had my first self-initiated out-of-body experience, and I became completely hooked on the topic. It's exciting. It's uh, it, I found it to be a way to obtain the answers for yourself, and I still feel that way, and I feel str stronger than ever about it, that we live in a society filled with belief systems and the only way to really know the answers is for us to expand our exploration of consciousness so that we can, each of us can obtain the answers and no longer be a pawn of uh, institutional belief systems that so dominate. Um, and so that's, yeah, I feel, I feel that now more than ever, this information is needed and it's needed uh, on a global the message needs to go global because let's face it, if, you know, if everyone had an out of body experience, I mean, all 7 billion people had an out of body experience. I feel strongly that it would be the end of wars. It would be the end of many of the conflicts that you see today because it would be a giant wake up call to all of humanity. Like, Oh God, what am I doing? This is crazy. Um, that you would suddenly realize that what you are, you know, you're a, you're a, a non-physical being existing beyond this temporary facade and that we exist in this long spectrum of consciousness and that's just vast. And it would wake people up to the point where um, the entire group consciousness of the planet would be shifted. So that's why I feel it's important because the answers must come from within us, not outside, but from within us through our own personal experiences. So I tried to provide a workbook that would help people to have their own experiences. Yeah, I, I, I read, uh, I remember reading the uh, first book. I mean, it's been a couple of years now and it kind of read, at least the beginning part, read like uh, journal entries, like, uh, you know, July 5th. 1978 or whatever and you you know have this elaborate experience that you wrote about and i just found it fascinating just to read you know like these these stories uh, these experiences you had since that book has come out i think you published that in the 90s was that right yes that was uh finally published i wrote it uh, actually in the early 90s and it was published in 96 how have those experiences changed you know a couple decades later i don't know if that's something you can talk about or really explain that well um well or? it's that is a, it's a difficult question because it's my perception of reality is always changing based on my experiences um i find more and more i realize that our physical experience is such a small aspect of the totality of what we are that's number one number two one of the most shocking things i learned is that when people die, they don't go to some pristine, heavenly world filled with angels and uh, the golden gates and all this stuff. It, that's not what most people experience. Most people, and this is something that, that surprised me um, more than anything, most people experience a what would could only be considered to be an, uh, a duplicate or simulation of the physical world because that's what they're used to and people continue to limit themselves by their own self-conception for instance if you seven billion people on the planet and they consider themselves to be human they've been conditioned to believe well i'm a physical human and i'm a male i'm a female i'm this country i'm a member of this race these are all self-conceptions that we have hold of ourselves and we carry that with us into the afterlife. And this is what limits humanity. In other words, if you believe that you're a female and you die, you still will be a female. And 
how can we ever achieve the higher realities that are within this multidimensional universe when we always limit ourselves to these biological, very limited uh, bipedal human forms? And that's what humanity has done. That's why I feel that when I have out of body experiences and others have these experiences, the, the heaven that people experience is a very limited projection of physical reality because that is where their self-conception has limited themselves. In other words, you can only experience what you accept and conceive. And since everyone still perceives themselves in this limited three-dimensional humanoid form, that's what they will experience after death. And it's a very limited, I call it a consensus reality, or many millions of cons consensus realities that people enter it. And they're, they're pleasant, don't get me wrong. These are beautiful realities compared to Earth. There's no, there's no illness, there's no wars. But they're still, when people die, they move. Just I use this in, sometimes as a visual. People, you, people move like a quarter of an inch into the pure multi-dimensional nature of the universe. And, and some people say, no, that can't be true. But this is why psychics can so easily have contact with so many people that, are, that have died. Because they're standing next to you. They have only shifted their state of consciousness and their energy body. They haven't moved into the, the great higher dimensional realities that are available to all of us. They've only shifted and moved to the next dimensional level or energy phase. And uh, this is, the I think, one of the things I think it's so important to get across, um, uh, that, that, that we need to become more uh, knowledgeable and enlightened about the, our evolutionary cycle that we're actually in. Because we're all evolving through form, but yet humans remain attached to the form. And that's what's limiting them. Now, do you ever have anybody that challenges you and says, well, how do you really know what happens when people die? You're still alive, so you're having these out-of-body experiences, but you're coming back to the physical form. How can you be so sure that there aren't angels there, that there aren't flowers and gardens and kind of what maybe people are expecting? Well, I, that's just because of 40 years' experience and also, I've had the opportunity, as you know, to work with thousands of people over the last 40 years uh, and with other out-of-body explorers. Uh, I, you know, we, I trade information. I, I don't rely on just my own. As you know, I've done a survey that, that has 18,000 responses. And almost no one of these thousands of responses have seen angels. Now, I mean, that's, I mean, it isn't just me. Now, I'm not saying that such things don't exist. Maybe in the higher, much higher dimensional realms. I'm, an, I'm very open-minded to all, anything we can imagine can probably exist. I'm just talking about what is the evolutionary trajectory of the average person? Where do they go? And we, as believers of religion and this self-conception, we limit ourselves because what do we take with us when we die? We have to look at it that way. And I think everyone agrees. We take, the only thing we take with us is our state of consciousness. We take nothing else. We take nothing biological, of course. And that's all we have is our state of consciousness. So we take our beliefs with us. We take our self-conception with us. And with because of this, we also take the limits that we carry with us. And this is what I and others have observed. And I know it's not the uh, everybody likes to talk about all these wonderful things. But uh, and I, I'm sure that they exist. But for the vast majority of humanity, they're still stuck into their self-concept. Yes, and for those of you who are interested in actually seeing the results of that survey that William did, you can find that in his second book, The Secret of the Soul. Yeah, it, I think that would be very interesting just to read, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, experiences. And I, I've dealt with 
uh, putting out these movies, I've dealt with a few skeptics and, uh, and I, I kind of, at these screenings, I've, I've talked about some of my experiences having an OBE and I, I know that even when I was first starting out, this is probably early 2012, some of the experiences I had were very kind of dreamlike and I didn't really know if it was uh, a dream or a lucid dream or just maybe I really was out of body. But then later in 2012, um, when we were in the thick of editing Beyond the Physical, um, I had this experience that was real beyond real and when i came back it was very almost strange like alien like to be back here i mean the experience only lasted maybe a minute two minutes but it was just such a, a profound experience and it was nothing dreamlike about it at all and um but then since then i've had other experiences that were more dreamlike again and is this real? Is it not real? Have you had that? And, or at least when talking to other people, um, the same kind of experiences that um, you don't know that they're, they're real, but then you have some that are super real. It's almost like... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's one of the reasons I'm doing a six-day workshop. Um, one thing that I learned early on, probably in the second year of my experience, is that I could upgrade my state of consciousness during the experience. You know, we have to remember, we're even in the physical world. We're we we our mental capacity changes from moment to moment. Some days we're sharp, for instance. Some days we're not. When you wake up, you're groggy. In other words, there's a spectrum of consciousness in the physical world. The same applies to the non-physical, except the spectrum is much greater. It's up to us to upgrade our state of consciousness. This is what I. One of the primary things I teach in my workshops is that we have the capability to self-direct and upgrade or enhance our own state of consciousness, no matter what the experience. For instance, what I try to train people to do, if they're in a lucid dream, then try to remember to the best of your ability, condition yourself to use a power phrase to upgrade that state of consciousness. For instance, awareness now is a very powerful phrase or clarity now. In other words, use a power phrase that will essentially trigger your state of consciousness to become more and more self-aware. Because there are, it's a vast spectrum of consciousness that we're dealing with, from total dreams to different levels. One of the lucid dreaming authors claims that there's seven levels of lucid dreaming. In other words, there's seven different states that we enter just in lucid dreaming. Now, I don't know if it's seven or not, but my point is there's obviously various states of consciousness that we experience. And it's up to us to take control because it's the only thing we possess is our state of consciousness. So once we condition ourselves to upgrade or enhance our state of consciousness, we can begin to take, let's just say, take advantage of our in other words, you could take a lucid dream, which is a dream where you begin to become more aware, but then turn it into an out-of-body experience by just using a power phrase like clarity now, and you demand it. In that state, that lucid dream, you demand to experience full awareness, awareness now, and you demand it and you repeat it. And often this will, this is the deciding factor in these inner experiences. It's up to us to take control. And that's one thing that's not taught in our society today. People just ride along on their experiences and they don't really try to alter them or enhance them, generally speaking. In other words, they're just, they just go for the ride in the dream state. So my point is that even in OBEs, there's many different states of awareness and this is one thing I try to get across. It's not a place because we exist as a multidimensional spectrum of consciousness and we go through different states. Just think every time we, we go to bed at night, we're going into a trance state essentially, and then we're going to sleep. We're going through different brainwave states, alpha, beta, delta, 
you know, and in other words, we're always shifting consciousness, but it's up to us to learn how to let's get the most out of our experiences. And I think this is what this is what the difference is. Once you realize this, you can begin to exert more control, not only over a lucid dream, but over your OBEs and get more, let's just say, more enhanced knowledge because you're more aware in that experience. And for somebody who's not familiar with your work or your workshops, you're very, you're very big uh, proponent of uh, no hallucinogenic drugs or caffeine or alcohol. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I feel that we have to go natural. Right. Because you can't control, especially hallucinogens, um, even natural ones like um, ayahuasca is very popular today. I'm familiar with the, the things that are out there. I've done shamanic ceremonies when I was younger. I, I you know, so I, I can speak from some experience. The problem with these and even the plant substances that are so popular today, I'm not trying to make any kind of moral judgment. It's not that. It's about control. You have to be able to exert your control. And unless you've been really trained um, to control your state of consciousness uh, in all different circumstances, um, th any kind of external plant medicine substances or DMT, it doesn't matter, can initiate um, a pretty wild ride for people. And often people lose control of their own state because things are happening very quickly. Uh, fears arise, for instance, is very common in uh, some of these experiences. You will, um, let's just say, you will experience issues will come up to the surface that you may have been holding back because you're open now to this to happen. So you, ha you have to be trained to be able to handle these kind of situations. So the best way, the best approach is a natural approach. Okay. And I, I know from my own experience, and this is mainly with uh, dreams um, that I've had, I became, I don't know if this, if you've ever had anything like this. When I was on an antibiotic a couple years back, I had the most vivid dreams. Have you ever had any effects with an OBE in antibiotics or anything like that? Um, not with antibiotics, um, okay. but with other. Um, uh, in 2011, as you know, I was diagnosed with um, cancer, and I was I had surgery done, and I was on painkillers, and I noticed that painkillers would initiate all kinds of experiences especially if you're, you know, really strong painkillers, whatever it may be. And I noticed that I was fortunate, I think, because of my tr my personal training and having 30 years of experience, 35 years at that point, I knew how to handle these altered states of consciousness that arose when I was when I was under the influence of these painkillers. I write about this a little bit in Adventures in the Afterlife. Yeah, in other words, it, it's all about being prepared for these altered states that come up. And the more prepared you are, the better you will be able to um, handle these states. Was there a different quality to the experiences that you were having on those heavy duty painkillers as opposed to the natural OBs that you've had? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, once I left my body, I did not really, it's, it sounds almost strange, but once I totally separated from my body, um, I've trained myself so I can maintain that state for some period of time. And it took a while to get there. Generally, you know, most people's experiences are like a minute, like yours, you, you mentioned, Mike, a minute, right. two minutes at most. But once you train yourself, you can maintain it. I found that once I was out of body, I was very sharp and clear. It's only when I was still connected to the body that I was being influenced. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I experienced. In other words, the drug did not influence my non-physical body. The okay. drugs only influenced me when I was 
partially in my physical body. So in a way, it kind of it was like a launch point for me because you get you know you're so relaxed. It was easy for me to have out of body experiences when I was uh, under the uh, influence of these, especially for about three weeks, I was under the influence because I had some serious surgeries done. And for about three weeks, in a sense, these, they were, the drugs, in a sense, were actually assisting me in a way, if, if I can, that's a weird word, but they were, they were, I was in such a relaxed state, it was easy for me to self-initiate an OBE during that state, especially. And that's what I would do to escape the pain. Because only only time that I was escaping my my the pain that I was having is when I left my body. So it, it was an it was a, almost a self motivator. Gotcha. And do you want to speak more to uh, your newest book, Adventures in the Afterlife? Because since you started uh, just describing a little bit where some of that inspiration was coming from. Yeah, the Adventures in the Afterlife was written while I was recuperating in 2011. I was in bed. Um, I had stage four cancer of the lymph nodes and tonsil. Uh, and so I, I had a, 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 let's just say I had a, a serious neck operation to remove the lymph nodes in my neck. And it was incredibly painful, especially in the throat area. And um, I, I had to recuperate. Then I had 30 radiation. I, I went through the traditional treatment methods. And I was recovering for, my God, it was four or five months because I couldn't speak. I couldn't swallow. It was, and I just basically, while I was laying in bed, I, I'm not the type to just lay there. So I started writing about my experiences. And I was having some pretty wild, lucid dreams, and I was having a lot of out-of-body experiences during that phase. And I began to write my experiences for that four, during that four-month period. And after I was done, I had this huge journal, essentially. And what I did, I decided to take my personal journal and turn it into a story that I thought people could relate to, because I didn't want the book to be about me, me, me. Um, I wanted it to have a broader context. And I was having a lot of experience where I was meeting people that had died already, including uh, my mother and others. And what I did in the book, I thought it was important to provide this trajectory of consciousness after death and what I observed. Now, and what I did, I pieced together all the all the experiences that I had, and I wove a story of what happens after death, specifically, and what what the types of reality that you enter, because these are the realities that I experienced. My mother actually gave me a tour of where she lived while I was recovering, my, my deceased mother. And I wove that into a story that shows the potential changes because it's the the afterlife is not a place it's millions of states of consciousness is maybe a better way to look at it and each state of consciousness creates its own reality or consensus reality of group thought that's what i experienced and there's endless of these realities and they're always growing and they're changing because the group consciousness is growing and changing and I wanted to show that in a story so people could get a feel for what it's like and what they could, the potential of what they could do. In other words, don't stop growing because you're, you died. You don't just go to a heavenly world and that's the end of it. That's the beginning. And that's what I wanted to get across, that we continue to grow, we continue to learn. We, in the storyline, my character... Frank goes into a training reality, uh, an ad, um, advanced school of spiritual training, and he receives training on becoming a multidimensional, a fully multidimensional being. In other words, how do you become more spiritually advanced after death? And that's what I tried to convey through the book. And um, that, that's how it evolved. 
it was basically um, I wanted to get across the idea of this continuation of our spiritual growth after death. That it isn't just the physical, then you go to some heavenly world and you pop back into the physical. There's a lot that's occurring all the time. The vast majority of our evolutionary cycle is non-physical because we're non-physical beings. We're non-physical species. So do, that is where the real work is done. We, we, this continuation of our evolution through various non-physical realities. And I, I, I wanted to broaden this topic by providing that information. Yeah, I, I thought the, the adventures uh, in the afterlife was very fascinating because it's real and using air quotes, real world experiences in a fictional with a fictional character. It was, you know, your own experiences that you were having. And you kind of talked about it where, you know, he, this character that you created dies a few pages into the book. And I don't want to give away too much, but shortly after he's kind of like where I, at least where I felt I was reading the book where you're stuck in this collective conscious group that have their own beliefs and he's trying to be a free thinker and trying to break out of that like there's got to be more to this you know and I, I just thought it was a good read and I, I just really liked it and um, yeah and then of course he goes into all these other adventures where he's learning as you said do you have, uh, is there another, are you working on another book right now or are you? Yeah, yes, I am. Matter of fact, um, I'm working on a book. The working title is Destination Higher Self. It's um, the purpose of the book is preparation and training for the afterlife. I, what I, my goal is to try to provide a modern, um, a modern training that prepares people to go beyond the consensus realities of the uh, denser portions of the astral to get people to go beyond um, their the familiar dense realities that that make up a large portion of what today is called the astral dimension i don't like that phrase but that's what everybody calls it so uh in other words to to help people to at death, they use it as a launch pad. This is an important, people don't look at it this way, but death is an incredibly important projection of consciousness, a shift of consciousness, and we can use it. And this is what the Tibetans have been talking about forever. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, they go into detail about how to accelerate your consciousness so that you go beyond the thought forms of the astral world. And what I've tried to do in this book uh, is to present it in a modern format where it's understandable. Um, in other words, to prepare yourself totally so when you're at the point of transition that we call death, you would do what Robert Monroe talked about, and that is you project you you project your consciousness beyond the astral. And go to your true self, your higher self, what many people call it today. So use it as a launch pad, not just as a fear-based, oh, I'm going to believe this and I'm going to just lay here and hope for the best. But be knowledgeable about the whole process. Because it's about death is a launch pad for consciousness. And we have the capacity to use it. And, you know, the... The Tibetans, the, the Buddhists have been saying this for uh, over a thousand years, it's, but it's not been presented effectively, I think, to the Western world in a way that the average person can grasp it and go, oh, I see. And that's what I'm, that's the purpose of the book. I'm trying to present it in a way with a, a plan. In other words, a spiritual directive. You go to your deathbed with a mantra in mind, for instance, higher self now or spiritual essence now, and use your death as a launch pad to go to the highest spiritual realms you can achieve instead of just hoping and praying for good things. And the book also will provide guidance for your loved ones, how to help your loved ones 
to go to that level. Because of this, I also created a, a new two CD set that Monroe Products is releasing next month called uh, Destination Higher Self. And the purpose of this CD set is to be played by your side of the bed of someone who is dying. And it's affirmations to assist them to move to their higher self or spiritual essence. In other words, it may, it's, it's like a series of directives that and affirmations to assist the dying. It's the same thing that the Buddhist monks have been doing for a thousand years. And when they surround their fellow monks, they chant certain phrases to assist their friends to move beyond the thought forms of the physical. In talking about the destination of the higher self, you're also offering this as a new workshop if people want a hands-on experience. Isn't that right? Yes. Um, starting this year in August, um, I will be doing a new workshop called Destination Higher Self. And the whole purpose of the workshop is to prepare the participants uh, for the afterlife journey. And um, one of the center points of the workshop is going to be the spiritual directive. In other words, focusing on in writing, you will create your own spiritual directive about what you want the people around you to provide. And it goes into great detail. Um, they, it will train individuals to absolutely be not only prepared for this journey of consciousness to the best of their ability, but to provide the tools they need around them. For instance, this two CD set I created, I want, I'm going to train everyone to create their own. In other words, people will create their own affirmations that, that resonates with them. And that will be played by their bedside at the moment of their death for their, for their loved ones and for their own, for themselves. In a sense, this replaces, um, for for many, many centuries, like I mentioned earlier, the monks would surround and they would chant certain phrases about going to the clear light of the void, for instance, is, a, is one of the phrases. Go to the clear light of the void. Go to the clear light of the void. Uh, what I've tried to do is put this in, into a modern uh, context where it would be Go to your higher self. Go to your spiritual essence. Spiritual essence now. Make your own powerful CD. And this is what I did with my Monroe product, that I, my, my, my Monroe 2 CD set. Because I know many people don't want to go to the effort of making their own, I've done it for them. And this 2D, 2 CD set provides the affirmations but you can also make your own, which is what I recommend. Make it customized for you or for your loved ones. For instance, if you have a, a mother or father dying, you can, you can make a customized affirmation CD and have it playing by their bedside softly with music. You could add hemisync. You could do anything you want, but you could, you could add um, whatever affirmations you feel is fitting for your loved one. And because let's face it, most people die alone today. They, they, and most people in America, the vast majority of them now are dying in institutions. It isn't like it was 50, 60 years ago. So we have to change with the times and we need to provide assistance, I think, for not only ourselves, but for our loved ones. And that's the purpose of the workshop to be prepared. I also go into great detail about what the afterlife is how do the rules of the road work for non-physical reality? So I cover a lot of different topics so, so people you, are more prepared. And I know that you said this is launching in this, uh, this August, but do you have any feel for who might be attending? Do you think that you might get more participants maybe who have recently been given a uh, diagnosis of a long-term illness or they are facing their deaths? Or do you think that you're going to get a lot of you know, explorers maybe who are completely healthy, but they're just really looking to plan for this to happen. Um, it's it's both. I, I've already because um, registration is already underway. So I'm getting both. Um, I'm getting people that want to be able to assist their loved ones and be educated about it. Um, 
because I'm uh, in this workshop, I'm not just going to be covering the uh, it also will be covering physical, um, the physical and the non physical. Uh, so I, it's a mixture of right now of both people that are want to be able to assist their loved ones. Um, I'm getting um, people that are involved in hospice um, are, are, are signing up to attend. And also those that are a little bit older and they want to be prepared for this journey of consciousness. In a way, um, my, the OB intensive also helps people in this regard because out-of-body experiences are one of the best ways to, to become comfortable with non-physical reality. Once you're familiar with the out-of-body state, you, you're much more comfortable with the whole concept of leaving your body and, and maintaining a, let's just say, a focused state of consciousness. Yeah, I think it's great the work that you're doing with this and expanding into this afterlife arena because I really don't think our society has language for death. It, it almost seems like we don't really know how to handle it. A lot of us aren't talking about it. We don't deal with it until maybe a person in our family dies. Nobody really knows how to react. So like you said, many people are dying alone or families will get the phone call that, you know, so-and-so passed away. It's, you know, time to come in, but rarely are they really surrounding the person and supporting them through their transition. So I think this work is, is awesome that you're doing. I'm so happy to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's really important nowadays. Um, I, I've had both of my parents die and uh, other loved ones that have passed. Uh, and I noticed in every incident uh, that there was, there was more attention given to the flowers than there was to the individual that is dying. And I just found that unbelievable. I mean, and I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. People are uncomfortable. They, and they, so it's, even when you visit someone, the talk is about, you know, s silly stuff. Right. And no one's, no one's considering the state of consciousness of the individual is dying. And what's interesting, according to all of, all the medical data we have, the dying person, the last sense to go is hearing. This, of course, is so in other words, people that are dying still hear everything that's said. They can respond internally. So it's important the kind of input that we give them. To, so we we have this opportunity to assist the dying to reach higher states of consciousness within themselves if we would take the time and the effort to do so. We could provide real, real assistance, I think. And it's just not done in our society today. I just want to step back a bit to uh, your, the OBE intensive at the Monroe Institute. So you've been doing this for about five years now, and you've had, I don't know, probably close to 100 people, maybe? Oh, it's say. hundreds. More, hundreds? Okay. Now, you've probably heard some crazy experiences that people have had during this intensive workshop. Is there something new that you've never heard before come through um, that somebody may have experienced? Everybody's experiences are different. Um, I, I hear so many different things that I, it's hard for me to even, you're opening up a subject that's so vast, it's, it's hard for me to even pinpoint. People experience all kinds of things. And, and it's all about their own perceptional, the way they perceive their reality depends on the energy body they're experiencing. There's a lot of elements involved. Um, so uh, I, I, I can only say that I've, some of the experiences get pretty wild and um, everybody is so different that there's no, there's no real baseline per se because everybody's at a different place in their um, evolution of consciousness so the perceptions that people have vary quite quite a bit now i have a question too do you find are there any obe addicts 
people that just want to be out of body all the time. They like can't get enough because one of the things that I think about is obviously we came here in physical form to have some sort of physical experience. So, you know, I'm thinking if you're having these OB experiences or you are learning more about how to elevate your consciousness or learning about that higher self, and then you can incorporate that even more into the physical experience that we're, I don't know, we might enjoy the ride a little bit better here. But what really is kind of like that purpose to keep going out of body and having these experiences or practicing it daily when we are here to have that physical experience? How do you combine the two? And do you find that it can get a little addicting or that people just sometimes being in the physical form isn't so much fun? So I'd rather be traveling out, out there and inducing these OBEs. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's all about obtaining the answers for yourself. And as long as you have questions about the mysteries of life and your existence, there's always, um, there's, there's always that need, I think, internally that drives myself, for instance, to have more experiences. Uh, there's so many, there's so many questions, you know, like, let's face it, the average person I mean, look at it is on this, and I, I use this analogy before, but we're on this 80, 90 year journey. And, you know, we don't, we don't know even where we're going or what we are or what our purpose is. We don't know where we come from before we were born. I mean, most people just have no answers. So there's a lot of un, there's a lot of mysteries that need to be solved. And I think people, um, to answer your question about the connection, and it's this, I think it puts physical life into a sharper perspective, a much grander, greater perspective that you begin to understand your physical life because you begin to see the spectrum that you're, you're truly in. Because yes, we're in a physical body, our physical body is extremely important. And I, I would never um, de-emphasize that our primary mission here is in our physical body. There's no doubt. And that's where our lessons are being undertaken. But once you get a broader perspective of your physical life, it's, it's like suddenly, you know, what decision to make in a much from a higher perspective. So you're not caught in the weeds so much. The average person has no vision of their future and where they're headed spiritually. They're caught essentially what I call they're, they're in the deep weeds. You can only see a foot in front of you. So what's going to happen? There's going to be a lot of drama. There's going to be a lot of conflict. There's going to be a lot of potentially tragedy because you don't see, it's like driving a car with no headlights. You can't see what's in front of you. OBEs potentially give you that vision that you can see what's ahead of you to some extent. And you put your entire life into a much broader pers perspective of why you're here, what you're doing, what's important. Um, and it changes you in that regard because you suddenly like I, I'm not interested in sports. I'm I'm just not because I I just find it meaningless. Um, there's it, it's it's a it's a personal call. I focus on now what I feel is most important, and that is I feel the most important thing we have. It's the only thing we have is our state of consciousness, and we have to. I feel we have to accelerate our own state of consciousness or expand our own state of consciousness. And that's what's truly important. And I think it puts your physical life, it gives your physical life more meaning, not, not less. It's not escapism. I think that's kind of what you were leaning towards a little right. bit. Is right. it a form of escapism? No, it is not. Because it's a form of exploration of what is. So that you understand that, oh, yeah, the physical world is important, but by God, I'm much more than physical. So there's much more going on than just this temporary experience. And once you understand that, you begin to see your life 
in a much broader perspective and you can make moves in your physical life in a much more elegant manner. You can avoid physical conflicts and drama sometimes because you get this broader perspective. So it adds an, this incredibly new element and dimension to your life. It doesn't take away from the physical experience. I think it adds to it because you understand the physical events. For instance, I know my twin boys. I know those twin boys and who they were and our soul group situation. I know that. So I, I have a broader perspective of my family unit beyond just, oh, that's my sons. I know that we were in past incarnations together. I know our connecting points and how it connects. And it adds a whole broader dimension to life. It doesn't, it doesn't detract. In fact, it's, it's suddenly the world becomes, the physical world becomes far more fascinating and interesting because you begin to see the dramas for what they truly are. Now, your, your sons that you brought up, um, and we talked about this in Beyond the Physical as well. Did you know that they were, when uh, before your wife was pregnant, did you know that they were coming into this world? Or was there some sort of premonition? I don't, I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, you said you know your soul group. Did, did you know that they were coming ahead of time? Or yeah. Okay. I knew that when my wife was pregnant, I, I discovered some information. But this, you don't need OBEs to do this. Psychics could do this also. Right. Anybody that becomes sensitive, I'm not trying to limit this to just OBEs. Just to, I want to clarify. OBEs open up our awareness so that we're more aware of what's non-physical that's happening around us often. And... Um, the same applies to someone that's truly psychic. So, being psychic is just being more sensitive to energies that are around us. And that's what OBEs do also. They open out-of-body experiences by their very nature, open us to these unseen energies and realities. To some degree, everyone's different. But we open up to these things and we begin to get insights into the nature of the realities that are not only going to occur, but what may be may occur, because there's potential things that are always in play. And that that's what I mean by giving us a broader perspective of our physical life. Because we begin to see there's a multi dimensional playing ground playing field, it, it's like playing chess. The average person is playing chess on that one dimension. Once you begin to become psychic or have out-of-body experiences, you're starting to play, play the game of life in a, in a multi-dimensional chess field. And it adds more, let's just say, insight into the physical, which is the chain of events. The physical is the end result of a chain of events. And being opening up to your own potential, you begin to see this multi-dimensional chain of effects occurring. Wow, that's interesting. It's a good way of putting it. I just have to ask one last question. Um, you've had, you just mentioned before, you had over you know hundreds of participants at your workshops and you do these out-of-body uh, hands-on experiments. Have you had, uh, or I, I don't know how the right way to say this, but have you had shared experiences with the participants? Uh, people in the workshop on occasion have claimed, uh, for instance, I do, do a technique where people meet at the crystal. And uh, there has been multiple occasions where people have said that they have had contact with other members of the group at the crystal. Those kind of things do occur. Um, again, it's all, every group is different. Everybody in, in a workshop experiences different things. But yes, people have reported such things where they actually, let's say, 
communicate or have contact with one another, you know, beyond beyond the body. But the purpose of my workshop is to train people to provide the um, the, the training, the education and the techniques they need to have these experiences and to could begin to control them so that they can get the most out of them. My purpose is for people to obtain the, the answers for themselves. When that's my entire goal, to empower people so they have the ability, even in, an, for instance, in a lucid dream, to suddenly in a lucid dream, you take control of it and, and enhance that experience. That's what I want. That's my ideal goal. I want people to take control of their all of the various states of consciousness that they have during their life, not just OBEs. OBEs is just a part of the spectrum. And the more that we are self-empowered, the more that we can obtain the answers for ourselves. Uh, and that's what's critically important nowadays, especially in a world surrounded by belief systems. This is great, William. I feel like we could probably sit here and talk to you for five or six more shows on so many different topics related to this. I feel like we're just really um, touching the surface of all the information that you have for us that we could share and all the different subjects and how they intertwine with OBEs. Um, and again, if you would like to get more information about William Buhlman, you can visit his website at astralinfo.org. And for those of you who aren't too familiar with the Monroe Institute, it's located in Faber, Virginia, and it's a nonprofit education and research organization devoted to the exploration of human consciousness. They have a ton of different workshops. Um, you know, William, as you know, is presenting there. He has great workshops, but there's other workshops that they present there as well for explorers of consciousness. So I think we're going to have to wrap up uh, for today, William. But as always, it's such a pleasure. Um, you can also find William in our films, The Path Afterlife and The Path Beyond the Physical. We do our, have our third film coming out, and we will be shooting some new footage of William in this year once that uh, third film is released. So we're really excited just to have you on board with our films and as always supporting all of the work that we do. And, you know, you have such great information that really needs to be put out there. And we're just great that we can kind of be that source to get that out to a bunch of different people in the world. And also, William, how, how can people get a hold of you if they want to buy your books or attend your workshop? Well, um, through my website, astralinfo.org is probably the best best place. Uh, as far as workshops, um, through my website, uh, they go, there's links to go to the Monroe Institute and um, either call or uh, email the Monroe Institute for uh, registration information. They take care of all that. That's the best way to do it. I, I hear that they're, uh, they sell out quickly and there's very limited space. Yes, only 24 people can attend a workshop at the Monroe Institute. My, my, my workshops sell out very quickly. Um, uh, so uh, I know right, right now my May and July workshop is already sold out. Um, so it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's, that's one of the advantages of the Monroe Institute is that there is only 24 people. So you do get some personal attention. It's not one of these things where there's 100 people laying on the floor and you don't even get a chance to talk to the instructor. This is a very, this is a residential um, experience where it's very, where you ha really have an opportunity to, to dive deep into this subject. And that's one of the things I really love about it. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. It's pretty much uh, hands-on with the trainer. Um, yes, indeed. That's pretty good. All right. We'll definitely have to have you back in the future. And best of luck with your workshops and your new book coming out. Oh, thank you. It's been, been my, my pleasure. It's always always great to talk, talk to both of you. Great. Thanks, William. Thanks so much.